Please join me in the chalice lighting words. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. Welcome. Settle into your seat and take a moment to just settle into your space. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Let us prepare our hearts for worship with these opening words from Reverend Dr. Adam Robersmith. Our theology tells us to choose faith and hope and deep abiding love over fear, to act from the knowledge that we will save what is of great worth and sacredness to us. Let us refuse to be made immobile by fear and despair Instead, choosing one more faithful action in every moment. Come, let us worship together. Please raise your voice and spirit for our opening hymn. Come, sing a song with me.
This morning, our wisdom is from Reverend Kathleen McTeague. They are still with us. In the struggles we choose for ourselves, in the ways we move forward in our lives and bring our world forward with us, it is right to remember the names of those who gave us strength in this choice of living. It is right to name the power of hard lives well lived. We share a history with those lives. We belong to the same motion. They too were strengthened by what had gone before. They too were drawn on by the vision of what might come to be. Those who lived before us, who struggled for justice and suffered injustice before us, have not melted into the dust and have not disappeared. They are with us still. The lives they lived hold us steady. Their words remind us and call us back to ourselves. Their courage and love evoke our own. We, the living, carry them with us. We are their voices, their hands, and their hearts. We take them with us, and with them choose the deeper path of living. In Unitarian Universalist history of social justice, we can find three types of voices that work towards change. They are the prophetic, parallel, and institutional. They are defined in the UUA Tapestry of Faith curriculum, Resistance and Transformation, as the following. The prophetic voices speak out against the conventions of the era and are often marginalized or considered ahead of their time with a strong vision of a better future. The parallel voices advocate for an alternative to the established structure, a new system to replace that which is deemed broken. The institutional voices seek to work within established power structures to change them from within. I want to share three stories from our history to illustrate how these voices show up. One is Henry David Thoreau as the prophetic, Margaret Fuller as the parallel, and A. Powell Davies as the institutional. These stories, again, are taken from the curriculum, Tapestry of Faith, Resistance and Transformation. First, Henry David Thoreau. Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also in prison. Henry David Thoreau wrote this in Civil Disobe Disobedience. In July of 1846, Henry David Thoreau was jailed for refusal to pay his taxes. Although he spent only one night in prison, this experience was the motivation for Thoreau to write one of his most influential works, Civil Disobedience. He says, I do not hesitate to say that those who call themselves abolitionists should at once effectively withdraw their support, both in person and in property, from the government of Massachusetts and not wait till they constitute a majority of one before they suffer the right to prevail through them. I think that it is enough if they have God on their side without waiting for the other one. Moreover, any man more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one already. If a thousand men were not to pay their tax bills this year, that would not be a violent and bloody measure, as it would be to pay them and enable the state to commit violence and shed innocent blood. In Civil Disobedience, Thoreau outlined a rationale for resistance to a corrupt state, a rationale that profoundly influenced figures such as Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, as well as many others who sought a nonviolent response to government oppression. Though raised Unitarian, Thoreau renounced formal membership in the institutional church as an adult. Thoreau was perhaps the most individualistic of an iconoclastic group who called themselves Transcendentalist, a group which inclined, which included Unitarians such as Emerson, Fuller, and the Alcotts. He was unconcerned with the niceties of social existence, choosing instead to focus on discerning the higher moral law that was, in his estimation, often obscured by society's pressures. As Emerson said in his eulogy for Thoreau, it seemed as if his first instinct on hearing a proposition was to convert it. 
So impatient was he of the limitation of our daily thought. This urge to push, push beyond the boundaries of conventional thought and habit was what drove Thoreau to his experiment called in Wal chronicled in Walden, a two-year effort to live a closely examined life in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts. His deep ecological sensibility was also unique for his time, and Walden is arguably one of the most influential works for the modern environmental movement. In his own day, Thoreau was not hailed as revolutionary social prophet. He was often considered simply an eccentric individual who followed his own conscience in all things religious and otherwise. Our parallel voice is Margaret Fuller. Now, Margaret Fuller was born in 1810 at a time when women could not attend institutions of higher learning. Although brilliant, she was denied the educational opportunities enjoyed by her father and her male peers. She persevered in her education on her own terms. She refused to accept the limited role of women in American society and was a pioneer on issues of women's rights. Both members of the Transcendentalist Circle, Fuller and Ralph Waldo Emerson, were intellectual sparring partners. She was an editor and contributor to The Dial, the most famous transcendentalist journal of the era. Plagued by financial troubles after the death of her father in 1835, she took teaching positions to make ends meet. Her work as a teacher included time as part of the faculty of Bronson Alcott's Experimental Temple School. Unable to attend Harvard Divinity School as Ralph Waldo Emerson and William Ellerly Channing and Theodore Parker had done, Fuller took it upon herself to create a place where women could discuss issues of ethics, education, theology, fine arts, and classical mythology. Discussions that male friends and husbands of her circle took for granted. She began holding salons, primarily for women, events she called conversations in the Boston bookshop owned by her good friend, Elizabeth Peabody. As topics for conversations, she often used the same books that were be being discussed at the Divinity School. Fuller was able to support herself for a time from income generated through these salons and was therefore able to write. In 1845, Fuller's most influential work, Women of the 19th Century, was published. Peabody's bookshop had become a meeting place for the growing women's rights movement, and Fuller's book encapsulated the work of that community. Horace Greeley, in his review of the book, stated, it was the loftiest and most commanding assertion yet made of the right of women to be regarded and treated as an independent, intelligent, rational being, entitled to an equal voice in framing and modifying the laws she is required to obey, and in controlling and disposing of the property she has inherited or aided to acquire. Hers is the ablest, bravest, broadest assertion yet made of what are termed women's rights. and our institutional voice, A. Powell Davies. Arthur Powell Davies did not start out as a Unitarian minister. He came to the United States in 1928 from England as a minister in a search of a freer strain of Methodism. Once he found his home in the Unitarian movement, he became one of the leading figures in American Unitarian Association and was an advocate for institutional growth and change throughout his career. He advocated for a move away from the view of Unitarianism as just another sect of Christianity, proclaiming, if we are just another Protestant denomination, then we have no distinction and no justification for larger scale advance. If we are what Channing called the universal church, then we must begin to be that church. Davies was a popular and talented preacher who was greatly involved in the social and political issues of his day. He wrote extensively in favor of the American pursuit of freedom, and when McCarthyism ran rampant through the country, his well-known anti-communist credibility allowed him to speak out against questionable government tactics without calling his own patriotism into question. By the 1950s, he was well-established in Washington, D.C. as the minister of All Souls Church Unitarian with influence that extended to several Supreme Court justices and even to the office of the president. 
Once he had been accepted as a powerful presence in Washington, Davies applied a change from within strategy to matters of racial desegregation. He worked to establish an integrated youth club and led a citywide campaign to patronize restaurants that were racially integrated, while at the same time he maintained his membership in a prestigious whites-only gentlemen's club, hoping to influence the power elite through institutional challenge channels. Each of these voices have had an impact in our Unitarian Universalist history, as well as our national history. Throughout our history as Unitarian Universalists, we have been these voices and continue to be them. We have worked in issues from the abolition of slavery to women's rights, to civil rights, to anti-war demonstrations, to marriage equality, to disability rights, to immigrant rights. Each issue has required many faceted responses from letters to the editor, to showing up in witness, to creating space for voices. We have constantly lifted up the need to provide education and information about the issues, to be in conversations with others, and to fight for those issues to become moral and ethical questions. We ourselves understand the continued learning and growth we need to engage to widen our understanding of the world and the issues. So as we listen to our musical interlude, I want you to take a moment and note the ways you have been a voice for social justice. Has it been prophetic, parallel, and or institutional? I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. Ooh, I believe in the power of kindness. Ooh, I believe in the power of love. We don't know what's coming. We can help shape what's ahead. With kindness as our currency, the commonwealth is in our hands. So give a little, give a little, give a little, give a little, give a, little, give a lot, don't stop. A helping hand makes the world go round, there's more than enough.
Currently, these voices are still showing up in our Unitarian Universalist faith. We saw the power of the prophetic voice in the worship service provided at the beginning of this month by the UU The Vote campaign. We heard it in the words of Alondria Williams in our worship in June. And our very own UUA president, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, continues to lead our faith with a prophetic voice challenging the status quo and encouraging us to see in new ways. Most importantly, we can find it in the report from the Commission on Institutional Change, calling us forward to live into our faith fully. We can see the actions and voices of the parallel voices in the work of the Black Lives of UU, who minister to our fellow UUs of color and provide them space, learning, and resources in order to fully participate in our faith until they are truly seen as equal voices. We find this voice in the work of trust, which is the place trans in, transgender UUs find ways to connect, to worship, and to be whole. In addition to Blue and Trust, there are similar groups for those with disabilities, the LGBTQ+, Indigenous, and many other groups who have felt the sting of exclusive community that can be found in our churches. Until we can fully see and be aware of our own biases in these relationships, these parallel spaces are needed within our faith. Finally, we have the voices that are institutional in their work. We have legislative UU groups who work on policy and legal changes within the institutions already established. We have groups who work to provide education and a pathway to immigrants. We have people who challenge the law enforcement institution, who challenge immigration officials, who challenge the status quo by creating a new vision. Not only do these voices challenge systems in our societies, but also in our faith. One such voice is the Commission on Institutional Change that challenges us to look at the systems we have built in our faith communities and our national association. How do we need to change? What new ways can we be a church? What new ways can we show up for each other? What new ways can we live our faith? What we do know about social justice in our faith is the work has to be grounded in what we believe, what calls us to act, and who are we in relationship with. The work has to be grounded or it cannot be sustained. It has to be based on what we believe or we will lose sight of why we are fighting. We have to be called to something greater than ourselves in this work or we will only be working for ourselves. This work must be done in relationship to hold us accountable, to give us support, and to keep us inspired. So when you are deciding how you want to participate in social justice, I hope you are asking yourself these questions. What is it I believe about this issue and why is it so important to me? How is it related to my faith? What or who is calling me to do this work? And who are the partners in this work and who can help me be accountable? We will continue to call on these voices, the prophetic, the parallel, and the institutional in our faith to work for equity, inclusion, and justice. Because we are led by a powerful force that has always been fierce, the power of love. Let us pray. Spirit of love and justice, May we find the voice we are called to offer our world. Give us the grounding we need to answer the call of justice and love. Keep us in relationship with others in this work. Amen. Please join together in spirit and voice for a closing hymn, Turning of the World.
voice with every song we will move this world along and our lives will feel the echo of our loving let us sing this Please join me in the chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please raise your hands in the spirit of connection for our closing song. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Thank you.